grace that is amazing. Lord, we thank you for the riches that we experience even at Christ's expense. We thank you for your mercy. Thank you for your goodness this morning. In your name we pray. Amen and amen. You may be seated this morning, and it is great to see all of you here this morning. Um, we actually do have several people out of town, so it's good to see a good group here this morning. And it's actually good because today we have lunch, so there'll definitely be enough food for everybody. Our kids are excused to go to Hidden Tour Kids this morning. And if you wouldn't mind opening up your Bibles to Daniel chapter 9 this morning, Daniel chapter 9, yes, we are still in the book of Daniel. I know I've been gone the past two weeks. I'm going to share a little story with you that has nothing to do with the sermon, but while we're kind of getting situated, uh, the, 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 this past couple of weeks, um, I went to Disney when I was in Orlando, and uh, I was with my, uh, my wife and my kids, and I was surprised at how much Disney costs. And I was like, wow, they've really raised the ticket prices to go to the happiest place on earth. I didn't know that being happy was going to be so expensive. So I went there with my family, and we had to plop down a good amount to go in for the day. And it was a lot. And, and I, said, I said to my parents, I said, you know, my parents who were also there who decided not to go, I said, Dad, why does it cost $500 for my family, my whole family and I to get into Disney? And he said, well, son, that's just the cost of happiness. I'm like, well, I don't want to be happy if that's the case, right? Because, you know, I used to live in Orlando, so I don't really need to go to Disney. I've been there one million times, but it's for the girls, you know, and... There's times in our lives that we have to simply do that for our girls' happiness. And so later that, that next day, after we went and enjoyed our $500 value at Disney, I went and we were going over to a friend's house, and he said, well, why don't you bring some picanha over? And I said, that's great. And I, I confess with you, picanha, I love picanha. And he's, a, he was, he's not a Brazilian, he's American, but he's married to a Brazilian, and he knows how to make picanha really well. And so um, I said, and since he kind of helped us out before, I'm like, I'm going to get a little extra picanha. But I didn't realize it was so expensive in the States. And, and I went there, and I spent probably, I don't know, it was about $63 on picanha. And I'm like, wow, that's a lot for picanha. And so I went back, and I talked with my old man, my dad. I said, Dad, help me out here. Help me out, because I spent $500 at Disney, and then I spent $63 on picanha. And, he, and dad said, well, let me ask you a question, son. <laughs> how much did you spend at, uh, how many rides, how many rides did you go on while you were at Disney that day? And I counted, well, we went on Nemo, we went on this and on that. I'm like, dad, we went on four rides, four rides. He said, well, you know what, son? You just spent $125 per ride. And I'm like, $125 per ride, that's really expensive for my family, my four kids to go on four rides because there was a lot of lines. So we're just like standing in line for like hours. And then I said, well, dad, you know what? I was frustrated too because I went to the market and I spent $63 on, or $62 on picanha. And he said, well, son, look at it this way. You, <laughs> you only spent half on picanha what you spent on one of those rides. <laughs> and I'm like, well, my dad has a lot of wisdom, right? Um, that really doesn't have a lot to do with our message this morning, other than that we should know that Daniel is a wise guy. Uh, he, he had a lot of wisdom, and we need to have a lot of wisdom as well. There are times in our life when things don't make a lot of sense, but the Lord still orients us, and he shows us that we don't need to spend money to be happy. Amen? You agree with me? All right. Well, anyways, um, you may have heard this phrase, God doesn't speak like he used to speak. God doesn't speak like he used to speak. A friend of mine once heard that, and he said, well, perhaps it's because people don't listen like they used to listen. Perhaps both of these things are true. Now, certainly God doesn't speak exactly like he did in the Old Testament in terms of how he spoke to the apostles. That is, there are not necessarily written revelations that are given to us today as they were given in Bible times, right? Because if there were written revelations, then actually that would not be good because what does it say in Revelation? 
the book of Revelation, that we can't add on to the scriptures, right? So, but God still speaks to us. He speaks to us primarily through what? His word. One time, I, people often say, well, I don't know what God's will is. I don't know what God's will is. Well, perhaps you just need to open the book that's on the shelf, and you'll see what the Lord's will is for your life. He speaks to us through his word. He speaks to us through his Holy Spirit. He may speak to us even through a dream or through a vision, subject to his word. But the primary way that God speaks to us is in times of prayer. And I do think in our fast-paced society, we often don't take the time to listen. And so the truth is, God is speaking, but are we really listening? Because, because the truth is, if prayer is your last resort, if it's the last thing on your mind, you're probably not listening even if God is speaking. Have you ever seen the movie Castaway? It's an older movie, Castaway. Naufrago. It's a film with Tom Hanks, who plays a guy named Chuck Noland, who's, on, who, who's a fast-paced, busy executive with FedEx. His plane crashes over the South Pacific, and he's stranded on an island. He's stranded on the island with all these parcels, all these packages. that land with him, all these encomendas, I think is the word in Portuguese. And so he's trying to survive on this island, and so he lights a fire. And with lighting this fire with his sharp stick, he cuts his hand severely, and there's a lot of blood coming out. And in his anger and frustration, he picks up one of the packages, this volleyball, he throws it over on the other side, and, and later he picks up the ball, and he notices that on the ball there's this big handprint. And the handprint is outlined with what? With the blood from his hand. And the volleyball is labeled Wilson because it's the Wilson volleyball. And, this, and, and, and because he has no one else on the island, this volleyball becomes his friend, Wilson, that has the outline of, of a face. And they spend their days together, and he talks with Wilson, and he pours out his heart to Wilson. And Wilson, at the end of the movie, gets taken away by a storm. And Tom Hanks, Chuck, gets very emotional because this inanimate object that he's been talking with for all these weeks is gone. Now, there's something very noticeable, something very interesting about this film. Imagine that you're stranded on a desert island. You would think that one of your impulses would be is to pray. Would you not agree with me? You would think that your impulse, if you're stranded on the desert island in the middle of nowhere, you have no hope of anything, your, your impulse would be to pray. But Chuck doesn't pray at all. He doesn't, excuse me, he doesn't pray at all. It shows the desperation of the human heart far from God. It also shows that who writes in Hollywood oftentimes doesn't have any notion of even what middle America thinks about. But he will talk to the volleyball, right? So he's there talking to the volleyball. He's not talking with God. He's talking to the volleyball. Now, before you, you criticize Chuck in this film, check your own heart. Because how often your own heart is not motivated to pray when God calls you to pray. Because oftentimes we prefer the company of something inanimate, like a volleyball to talk to, or something that isn't human, like a dog, I mean, that's why therapy dogs exist. Or perhaps our impulse is to merely talk to anyone, anyone around us before we talk to God. That's why we'll call our counselor, we'll call our therapist, we'll call that friend of ours. Some of us who are more mystical, people even still, I mean, some people pray to the dead as if the dead are going to be able to do anything. We'll talk to anybody before we'll talk to God. But perhaps you've heard this phrase in English that desperate times call for desperate measures, right? Well, prayer in some cases needs to be... Prayer many times is motivated by desperation, and that's okay. 
but it should already be a practice in our lives. We learn here in the scriptures that Daniel had a practice of praying three times a day. We talked about that a few weeks ago. Daniel had a practice of three times a day getting up, going in a secret place, and praying. Now, it's easy to be desperate to pray when you have a crisis on your hands, when you feel stranded. Perhaps you feel stranded today. And you see the need to pray because you're desperate. But my question is this, how many times do you feel that same sense of desperation or that same need to pray when someone else is in a crisis? And I'm not just talking about your kid or your parents or a loved one. But when someone else is going through a crisis, perhaps a nation, a city, a church, You'll definitely pray when your own child is sick, but will you pray when your city is sick? When your city is in sin? That honestly is a different level of prayer. I'm not, I don't want to over-spiritualize it, but it comes from a different heart because it comes from a heart of intercession. We need to grow into becoming people of intercession. We need to grow into becoming people who corporately confess sin. And those are the elements that we're looking at here in Daniel chapter 9. So as we continue this morning our series in Daniel, we skipped over a couple chapters because I really think that we said it a lot in the first six chapters. We got to seven, chapter 7. Perhaps you were there with us uh, last week, and, 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 and I'll share a little bit more about that. So let me give you a quick overview of what we studied in Daniel up to this point. The setting is Babylon in the year 600 B.C., before Christ. Daniel and the people who followed God were put into captivity. You remember this? You all with me? Kingdoms rise and kingdoms fall. Kings rise and kings fall. But Daniel and his friends remain steadfast. And so the book of Daniel is split into two parts, chapters 1 through 6, tell us the stories of great faith and great wisdom and great endurance of Daniel in the midst of great persecution, such as being thrown into the lion's den, or Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego being thrown into a furnace, or Daniel being forced not only to interpret a dream, but to tell the person what the dream is that they dreamt. These are great stories of following God no matter what the cost. And if you remember, as we talked about, from verse, sorry, from chapter 1, Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself from the very beginning, which set the stage for his entire life that was led by holiness, that was led, that was, he lived a godly life from the, from the very, very beginning. But then things got strange, as we talked about a couple weeks ago, in chapter 7. Because chapter 7 through 12, gone are the stories of great faith, and in their place is a lot of emphasis on prophecy, a lot of emphasis on prophecy, on dreams, on visions. We studied chapter 7 three weeks ago. I want to encourage you, if you missed that message, it's an interesting message to go back and listen to. It's online already. We talked about the end times. We talked about who is... Christ, who is basically, we see a figuration of Christ in that passage. Daniel wasn't just a man of great faith, he was a prophet. Jesus called him that. Daniel predicted the coming of our Savior in the last days. So that was chapter 7. Now we're moving on to chapter 9, and we're going to have one more week of this. In two weeks, we're going to finish uh, the book. But today we're looking at chapter 9. We're looking at this famous sort of prophetic prayer. Now, this prayer that Daniel prayed is a prayer of intercession, and it's a prayer of confession. Now, I think all of us want to have a more vibrant prayer life, and I believe that there's some keys in this passage that can help us have a more vibrant prayer life. And some of you are like, oh, another message on prayer. I've heard one million messages on prayer. Well, that means that you probably don't have a vibrant prayer life, because if you did, you'd be excited to hear this message, Right? So you, of all people, probably need to hear this message more. 
Now, there's a response to this prayer beginning in verse 19. It talks about the 77s and all this stuff. We're not even going to talk about the response of God to this prayer. It's a prophetic response, a lot of speculation about what the response is. We're going to look just at verses 1 through 19, and we're going to look at Daniel's heart as he prayed this prayer. We're not even worried about the response right now, because many times for us, we need to have that same heart. We need to worry less about the response, and we need to worry more about our heart in the context of our prayer. So that's what we're going to look at. So let's stand as we read Daniel 1 through 19 this morning. In the first year of Darius, son of Xerxes, a Medji by descent, who was made ruler over the Babylonian kingdom, in the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, understood from the scriptures, according to the word of the Lord given Jeremiah the prophet, that the desolation of Jerusalem would last 70 years. So I turned to the Lord God and pleaded with him in prayer and petition and fasting and sackcloth and ashes. I prayed to the Lord my God and confessed, Lord, the great and awesome God who keeps his covenant of love with those who love him and keep his commandments, we have sinned and done wrong. We have been wicked and rebelled. We have turned away from your commands and laws. We have not listened to your servants, the prophets, who spoke in your name to our kings, our princes, and our ancestors, and to all the people of the land. Lord, you are righteous, but the day we are covered with shame today. The people of Judah, the inhabitants of Jerusalem, and all of Israel, both near and far, in the countries where you have scattered us because of our unfaithfulness. We and our kings, our princes, and our ancestors are covered with shame, Lord, because we have sinned against you. The Lord our God is merciful and forgiving, even though we have rebelled against him. We have not obeyed the Lord our God or kept the laws he gave us through the servants of prophets. All Israel has transgressed your law and turned away, refusing to obey you. Therefore, the curses and judgments written in the law of Moses, the servant of God, have been poured out on us because we have sinned against you. You have fulfilled the word spoken against us and against our rulers by bringing us great disaster. Under the whole heaven, nothing has been, ever been done like been, what's been done to Jerusalem. Just as it was written in the law of Moses, all this disaster has come on us, yet we have not sought the favor of our Lord by turning from our sins and giving attention to your truth. The Lord God did not hesitate to bring this disaster on us, for the Lord our God is righteous in everything he does, yet we have not obeyed him. Now, Lord our God, who brought your people out of Egypt with a mighty hand, who have made yourself a name that endures to this day, we have sinned and done wrong. Lord, in keeping with all of your righteous acts, turn away your anger and your wrath from Jerusalem, your city and holy hill. Our sins and the iniquities of our ancestors have made Jerusalem and your people an object of scorn to those around us. Now, now, our God, hear the prayers and petitions of your servant. For your sake, Lord, look with favor upon the sanctuary. Give ear, our God, and hear. Open your eyes and see the desolation of the city that bears your name. We do not make requests of you because we are righteous, but because of your great mercy. Lord, listen. Lord, forgive. Lord, hear and act. For your sake, my God, do not delay, because your city and your people bear your name. This is the word of the Lord this morning. Amen? You may be seated. How many times in this passage you see Daniel saying, I have sinned, I've been a bad guy, zero. Verse 5, we have sinned and done wrong. Everybody say, we have sinned. Verse 5, we have been wicked. Everyone say, we have been wicked. Verse 6, or verse 5, we have turned away from your laws. Verse 6, we have not listened to your servants. Verse 11, we have sinned. Verse 13, we have not sought the favor of the Lord. Verse 15, we have sinned and done wrong. We, 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 not I, 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 I. And so, friends, this morning, there's a message here in this prayer for us. And the message is this. There are times in our lives when we simply need to stand up and take responsibility there are times in our lives when we need to take one for the team. There are times in our lives when we even need to confess the sins of those around us, even if we personally have not sinned. There are times in our lives that we have to confess on behalf of others 
as a means of intercession, as a means of supplication. But this is not easy for us. Let me tell you why it's not easy for us. We live in a culture that's incredibly individualistic. And the opposite of a life of intercession is a life of individualism. Do you get that? Now, I can point at the America, and I can say a lot of people are very individualistic. It's true. There's a lot of good things about capitalism, but one of the challenging things is it can make you into believing that you are a self-made man, that you've done everything in your own effort, and there's been nothing that anyone's done to help you. And so you begin to become very self-centered, egocentric. I earned my money with my own hands. The challenge is, who gave you your hands? Who decided that you would grow up in a country that would be fertile for the kinds of things that you want to do? I, 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 individualism. Very easy for those of us who are from the States. Now, that doesn't mean that we don't have another version in Brazil. We do. On the other side, Brazilians, sometimes we have the challenge of because we're so oppressed, because nothing functions the way we'd like it to function, sometimes we like to chit our vantagem. And so we'll do whatever we can, oftentimes, so that we get what we feel like we deserve, sometimes no matter what the cost. And so whether you're American or Brazilian or from another nation, all of us can struggle with this individualism, right? It's all about me. Notice in this prayer that Daniel's not saying, I have sinned, I have done wrong. You know why? Because he didn't sin, he didn't do wrong. But when everything is about us and our family and our needs and our dreams and our plans and our purposes, our focus will never be on others. Because functionally, it ends up like this. Your, indiv your individualism, your egocentricism, your tendency to only care about yourself will stifle a life of intercession. It will stifle a life of caring about others. If, you only, if, if it's not about you or your family or your kids or your parents, you never end up taking that thing to God and praying about it. It's not that you may not care. It's just that you don't really care enough to pray about it. Let me put it this way. Let's say that my daughter, Sophia, leaves a bunch of toys on the, on the floor. Now, this has never happened because she, oh, I'm just kidding. She leaves a bunch of toys all over the floor. She goes to take a bath. Olivia is there, and I say to Olivia, my other daughter, Olivia, can you please clean, can you please organize and put back the toys that Sophia left on the floor? Por de guardar todos esses brinquedos aqui. And Olivia is going to say to me, she's only five, but she already understands this, but Dad, I didn't make this mess because these are Sophia's toys. She made this mess. Ela que fez essa bagunça aqui. Now, that's one way for you as a parent to get a little irritated, right? Because you think to yourself, child, let me explain something to you. How many times in these past five years have you ate and rice and beans have fallen on the floor and you've made a mess? And how many times have I cleaned up that rice and beans that are smushed on the floor after you ate? For five years I've been doing it, and I'm probably going to still do it for a couple more years. 
How many times have I cleaned up your play area after you went to sleep? Because I knew you were too tired to be able to, to do it by yourself. Then you calmly explain to your child that there are times in our lives that we need to clean up the messes of others. That's just part of being a part of a family. It doesn't matter who exactly made the mess. We have a mess on our hands. We have a crisis on our hands. Daniel recognizes that. Who is willing to take responsibility is the real adult in the situation. And real adults intercede. Real adults don't live lives of individualism. Real adults stand up and say, we have sinned. We have not sought the Lord. We have done wrong. Daniel is confessing the sins of others and he's interceding for them. He acknowledges that their sins are great, but he also acknowledges that God's grace is greater. God's capacity to forgive is greater. Now, how did Daniel arrive at this moment? Let me give you a little bit of context. Chapter 9 of Daniel is chronologically happening at the same time as chapter 6. It doesn't you have, to, you have to look a little bit into the passage, but basically it's at the same time, chapter 9 and chapter 6. So Daniel is being prepared to be thrown into the lion's den. This is happening at the same time. King Darius is on the throne. Babylon has fallen. Da Daniel's made one of the three administrative governors over the land, so he had authority. He was a governor over the land, which is even more probably why he had this passion for, for the people and, and to confess the sins of the people. And this is exactly when those around him wanted to create an accusation. And so what they did was they created this trap for him, if you remember from chapter 6, where they said if anyone prays to the king, or sorry, if anyone prays to anyone else except to the king, then he's going to be thrown to the lion's den. They trapped Daniel. And what did Daniel do? If you remember, he went into his prayer closet. He opened the doors to Jerusalem, the windows, I should say, and he prayed. And we believe, most theologians believe, that this is the prayer that Daniel prayed in chapter 9 that is represented in chapter 6. Now, why is that important? Because Daniel's not there praying, God, get me out of this mess. I mean, I'm sure that's what was part of what he was doing. He didn't want to be chewed up by lions. But he's recognizing that what led him into this very moment was the corporate sin of the people. He's basically, he's not only saying, God, deliver me from this mess in some sort of escapist view. What he's saying is, God, please, please, please help our people to, to return to you. And if they return to you, perhaps our nation will move in the right direction. And perhaps we're not going to have a situation where people are trying to frame me, trying to, to trap me to throw me into the lion's den. He had enough maturity to see that it wasn't just about that moment, it was about what led to that moment. That's wisdom, that's adulthood, that's taking responsibility. That's what Daniel did. When Daniel learned that the law had been signed, he went home and he knelt down as usual in his upstairs room with his windows open towards Jerusalem, he prayed three times a day, just as he had always done, giving thanks to God. Daniel was engaged physically and emotionally with this prayer. Physically, he had been fasting. He is wearing a sackcloth using ashes. That's physical. Emotionally, he is pouring out his heart through prayer and supplication. That is is a prayer of intercession. That is a prayer of supplication. Supplication is a prayer, it's strong. It's stronger than just saying, please give me my way. It involves a level of intensity. It involves a level of emotion that usually comes naturally. It is strong, authentic. It's a pleading with the Lord that comes from the heart. We have sinned, we have done wrong, we have not sought the Lord. Now, look around the world, look around, or it's better to say, look at the world around you. Do you see a need for supplication? Do you see a need for intercessory prayer? 
As my wife and I were driving back from the airport recently, we heard gunshots. They weren't Fourth of July fireworks, they were gunshots in the morning on our way back from the airport to Baja. And to be honest with you, it's just so normal that I didn't even think twice about it. We need to see a need for intercessory prayer for our city. But if we're only focused on ourselves and our needs, we're not going to do that. But when we start to see the world through God's eyes, we will do that. One of the marks of spiritual maturity is a life of intercession. You may know a lot about theology, but if you don't know how to intercede, you certainly haven't arrived at spiritual maturity. Why is it such a mark of spiritual maturity, intercession? Because it's what Jesus does for us every day. The Bible says that Jesus intercedes on our behalf, does it not? He prays for us. He mediates between us and God. The more we intercede for others, the more we are becoming like Jesus. Do you see that connection? That's an important connection. Some of you remember the bracelet, what would Jesus do? I don't always know what Jesus would do, and I don't always like to speculate. But I know there's one thing that Jesus does. He intercedes. So if you want to be like Jesus, live a life of intercession. Intercession is the key to a lot of spiritual victory. Why? Because Jesus is the key to a lot of spiritual victory. James chapter 5 tells us what? That the fervent, effectual prayer of a righteous man avails much. Do we pray with fervor? If not, perhaps our prayers will not avail, will not result in much. It's not a formula, but it is a biblical principle. God wants our prayers to be sincere, to be heartfelt, to be led by the Spirit. Now, we're never going to be able to mediate for others the way God or the way Jesus does for us. And while we can confess the sins of others, can we atone for their sins? No. So there are some limitations. This is an important point. Daniel is not, when he's praying, he's not able to atone for the sins of those he's confessing on behalf of. But at the same time, God calls us to do exactly what Daniel did, to pray for others, to care. We need to care about the direction of our country to the point of praying for it. Do the sins of those around you even bother you anymore? Does the direction of your family or your church even bother you? I'm not trying to guilt us, but I want to test our hearts. If our hearts are not in the right place, we need to pray that the Lord would get us to the place that we would care enough to pray. We need to pray that the Lord would get us to the point to care enough to pray. Daniel had the habit of regular prayer three times a day. Now, he didn't fast every day. He wasn't in sackcloth every day. He wasn't with ashes every day. But there were moments in his life where he cried out to the Lord, and he says, we have sinned, we have done wrong, we have not sought the Lord. Remember Jesus' teaching on prayer? What does he say? Which of you having a friend, if you need bread, and went to your friend at midnight, and you say, friend, lend me three loaves of bread, and he said, look, it's midnight, I'm, home, you know, I'm at home with my wife and kids. I can't get up and give you bread. Because of your persistence, your friend will do that. Jesus calls us to ask. Intercessory prayer is not only about confession, it's about supplication. It's about asking. Therefore, ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and the door will be opened unto you. For everyone who asks, receives. And in, this, in, in the original language, it's continual. Whoever continues to ask, continues to seek, continues to, re, to, to knock will have a response. Jesus is teaching in that passage about persistence in prayer. Jesus is inviting us 
in our prayer life to be more passionate, to be more fervent, to be more authentic, to be more sincere, to be more persistent. Now, before we close this morning, I want to recognize that there are two primary reasons that we don't pray. The first I've already talked about, it's our individualism. It's our egocentricism. The second is perhaps even worse. We don't believe that God can really change things. The second reason we don't pray is a lack of faith. We don't believe that God can do a miracle. We have the sin of unbelief. A life of intercession is essentially a life, or sorry, a life that doesn't have any intercession is essentially a life of unbelief. Do you get that? Tom Hanks, who played the character of Chuck in Castaway, at the end of the day, suffered from unbelief. He didn't believe that God even existed, let alone that God could change his situation. And so he made his primary relationship with a volleyball, an inanimate object. Sounds ridiculous, but it's more common than what we think. It's unbelief. unbelief this morning and God is calling us to change if you find yourself in that place this morning not believing that God can really act not believing that God can really make a difference or change the situation or change something on your behalf or on behalf of someone else I want to pray with you this morning that you would begin to believe that you would begin to trust that you would begin to live a life of intercession that you would begin to see things as Jesus did. Jesus always knew that his Father was with him. Jesus always believed in his Father. Jesus always trusted his Father. Jesus always knew that his Father would, good, would give good gifts to him. Not just food and clothing, but even good gifts beyond that. The most perfect of those gifts being the gift of salvation, which is the greatest miracle of all. So perhaps the application this morning for us is simple. We need God to do something significant in our lives, great. But that's not what we're going to pray about this morning. This morning we're going to focus on others. I want you to think about a situation or someone in your life, other than your family, that needs prayer. Perhaps it's the person, perhaps it's the situation. Perhaps you have a real, you know, you're really connected to politics and you're worried about the, what's going to happen in, in November in terms of the direction of Brazil. You can pray about that. Perhaps you're frustrated with something that's happening in our city. Corruption. You can pray about that. Perhaps you look around and you see all the deviancy in the, in the family and all the problems in the whether sexual immorality of our city, and you want to pray about that. Or perhaps you're simply somebody at your workplace that doesn't know Jesus and you want them to know Jesus. The more you pray that way, those are prayers of intercession and supplication. It's not just saying help my kid to get better because first of all I want them to get better but second of all I don't want to deal with their sickness this is a prayer of intercession for something that may not immediately impact you but where you are willing to say we have sinned we have done wrong we have not sought the Lord I want us to see the need to stand in the gap to intercede to pray a prayer of supplication Perhaps it's a prayer of con salvation, confession, healing. I want you to just do that with one request this morning. What is one thing that you, you see where it's clear that God needs to intervene in the life of another or in the life of a city or of a people? Perhaps you need to write it down. Perhaps you need to commit it to memory. But this morning, I want us to spend just a moment and to pray for the, that thing, pray for that person, pray for that situation. Because that's the heart of Daniel, isn't it? 
That's the heart of Daniel. Even though he was facing a major crisis, he recognized the need to pray for his people. He recognized the need to pray for something that was actually much bigger than even the personal crisis that he was in. So one of the hardest things for you this morning may be to do this, to simply take your eyes off of yourself and to truly think about another and to pray for another and to intercede for another and to trust that God will move in the heart of another. We have sinned. We have not sought the Lord. We have not followed your ways. So I'm going to lead us in this very quickly this morning. I want to ask you to to close your eyes, to bow your heads, and as the worship team comes up, and if you could just play just the piano, gently. Father, this morning we come before you, and that person or that situation that needs your intervention, Father, this morning, We have this in our minds right now. And we want to bring this to you. We want to intercede for that person. We want to intercede in in the situation. We want to ask that you would intervene, that you would change. We want to ask, in, in some cases, Lord, even for a miracle, that you would change hearts, that you would change situations, that you would reveal what needs to be revealed. We want to pray, Father God, that you would help us to become more like Daniel, Father. Confessing the sins of others, interceding on the behalf of of others, Father. And in, in so doing, that you would change us. So, Father, this morning, as a means of supplication, we bring these requests to you. Whatever's on our mind this morning, Father God, and we ask that you would move. We pray, believing that your son will respond. We know it says, Father, in your word, to ask and will be given. And so we ask this morning, we seek this morning. In your name we pray, amen and amen. Let's stand as we sing a song of response this morning.